we really better get into gear. Whether we're talking political parties or government or society, this level of poverty will not be tolerated forever. So you, you fix it now. I'm Carol Ofori, and this is the Carol Ofori Podcast for thought provoking conversations. So this man is one of South Africa's favorite media icons. I can say for myself, one of my favorite media icons. And I've been looking forward to this conversation for months. When you think of South African television and particularly South African talk shows in the mid 90s and early 2000s, when you think of the dawn of democracy in South Africa and one of the pioneers who was at the forefront of media broadcast during this time. He was there asking those questions, profiling the people that some of us didn't even know at the time and the roles they played in the new dawn of a new South Africa. This man is currently an entrepreneur, a businessman, an activist, film and television presenter, director and producer, and is passionate about South African heritage, tourism and culture. He is currently the chairman of CIA TV, or better known to most of us as Moja Love. He's also the son of South African ANC presidential power couple of notes, two of the bravest people and most well-known anti-apartheid activists of all time, Mr. Oliver and Adelaide Tambo. He is with me right now. He's in his home and I'm so excited mm. to have you on the Carol Ofori podcast. Mr. Dali Tambo, welcome to the Carol Ofori podcast. Thank you so much, Carol. I'm getting a peek of your home from this video footage. Oh, and I must say, it reminds me a little bit of the set of people of the South. <laughs> <laughs> Would I be correct? Your home has got a beautiful African feel to it. Yeah, there's a lot of African culture in the house but of course there would be <laughs> yeah. uh, because we're africans of um, course. and you know we live in architecturally in the suburbs at least architecturally european homes and i think all of us feel a need to africanize to to establish our identity within those spaces I'm going to take you back to people of the South. And yeah. obviously everybody remembers those big black people of the South Christians <laughs> that everybody got when they visited the show. Do you have any fond memories of moments that stick out from that show? Yeah, I do. You know, I started in studio mm -hmm. and my very first guest, I was actually the precursor to people of the South was a, a show called Night Moves. That's right. On Mnet. And my very first guest was Nelson Mandela. The studio band was Jonas Gwangwa and his outfit. You know, I had members of just some brilliant musical talent there. And then, of course, um, it was the opening of me on TV. I had planned it in exile. And some of my friends said, are you mad? Why, why wouldn't you go into politics? And... I'd say, oh, I am in politics. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like what my father and mother do. I am in politics. so. Right. But I, I, I didn't want to go that way. There was a creative streak in me. I remember at the end of that show, two Africana ladies, quite elderly, they were standing in front of me and in front of a camera. And she says, uh, we really enjoyed that, didn't we, Meg? Yes, yes, we did. And then she says, do you know what, Daddy? If we'd known Nelson Mandela was like this, we'd have fought very hard to stop him being imprisoned. And there were two Mnet executives standing with us, and I could see they got it. Not from me, from what those ladies said. Wow. Um, that it changed their minds. It mm. introduced them to someone they had just been told was a terrorist leader. Wow. Um, and that was my aim with people of the South. It was to say, look, I know these people. They've been demonized. And you've been told black or white. You've been told this, that, and the other about Chris Hanyi and Tumbo and Mandela. Yeah. And this is what they're really like. Yeah. And I determined at that point that I was going to, when I came back, run a show that introduced revolutionaries, human rights activists, etc. As human beings, people you would never meet, mm -hmm. Ali would take you to meet. Yeah. And then I took it to their homes, and that was really us saying, now we're taking you for lunch with Jacob Zuma. Yeah. Now we're taking you for dinner with Baleka and Bete, et cetera, et cetera, and her family, or Robert Mugabe, or whatever. So that was it. 
I remember one particular interview that got a lot of people talking. It was the one you've just mentioned, your interview with Mr. Robert Mugabe in his home with the family. And so many people loved that interview. And then there were a few who felt like it was somehow sort of painting him in a nice light ahead of elections because elections were just around the corner. Does that still stick out for you, that dinner table with the... Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was very intimate, on camera, off camera. I mean, it was full-blown, you know, and he trusted me to do that. The point of the interview was to tell the history of Zimbabwe and its struggle and of this man and to take you to meet this man. And obviously, if you had owned land in Zimbabwe and been chucked off it and things like this, and you're now in South Africa, you'll have a certain perspective. One man's hero, one man's freedom fighter is another man's devil. But so, you know, that understood my intention was to give a full expose and take the viewer to meet the real man, the real lady, Grace, uh, his wife. And in doing that, I wasn't there to put him on trial, but I did ask difficult questions. Mm. And what they didn't like is he still shone. He was still shiny as hell. Mm. And that's because there is no other post-colonial leader of a liberation struggle who has transferred as much land back to his people stolen by the gun, by the colonialists. Let's not forget the first 12 years, mm. he was the Mandela of Southern Africa. That's true. And treated as such by the whole West. Only when he said, no, 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 I'm sorry, we're an agrarian economy. We have to have the land. And in the sanctions, the invasions, the military escapades they perpetrated against Zimbabwe to try and crush the economy. Well, they succeeded, they crushed the economy. There was also a lesson for us in South Africa. If you take your land, this is what will happen to you. We will mess you up. And you know we mean it because look what we did to Zimbabwe. So for me, I still get very beautiful comments from white South Africans, but the majority is from black South Africans, Zimbabweans, people from other parts of Africa. It was one of the SABC's most watched shows in its history. And yeah. it's testament, I think, to the fact that real stories have to be told. And if you look at what I asked Grace, his wife, first in my intro saying some people will call her Amazing Grace, some call her Disgrace, uh, but then asking her, did you have an affair with the governor of yeah, the Reserve that. Bank? And things like this are not normally asked. So for me, it was the, the essence of people of the South and what a lot of people have said to me since, in the years since, is thank you for educating me about the real man, you know, mm. and his wife, um, his family. And time has passed, but uh, that was, for me, the essence. At the same time, I love doing artists. I love doing Little Richard, James Brown, all kinds of people, you know, Gregory Hines, Denzel Wash, et cetera, et cetera. I, I love doing those people too because they're as fascinating in their own way yeah. um, as the rest. Would you say there was a particular interview that kind of left you, even today you think about it, you're like, that was so awkward and it just didn't go the way I expected it to go? Yeah, Sydney Poitier. Wow, okay. Yeah. What, what happened? He'd been on set all day. I'd been waiting in the hotel all day. And the interview was supposed to happen at 12 o'clock, and he rocked up at 7.30, 8 o'clock, obviously in a mood, obviously tired. You know, everything that could go wrong had gone wrong on set. And it was in Cape Town he was filming, and um, he felt obligated, I guess. You know, he had played my father in the film. Yes. So he felt obligated to do the interview. And I did say to him, you know, sir, we can do this in the morning. Because I was also tired, you know. <laughs> You've been waiting all day. He said, right. you know, I'm shooting in the morning from six. So I did that. It was so boring. He was so, like, two-sentence answers, oh, you know. Worst. Um, didn't want to talk about his personal life, you know, et cetera. And he said to me afterwards, he said, look, I'm used to doing stuff. I didn't realize your show was like this. I'm used to doing stuff which just promotes the film. And sorry, I'm tired, you know, if you want to rearrange, etc. So he was apologetic, but that, that was a horrible interview. I've had a few. 
<laughs> but I've had some beauties too, you know, yeah. Peter Ustinov. Uh, what a man. You just think people like you shouldn't die. Uh, mm. The Bee Gees, one of the best times I've had uh, oh, in a wow. program, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I have many lovely memories. Nurim Makeba in studio, so many. Um, yeah. I remember asking um, King Goodwill, Zue Latini, you've got like five, six wives. Do you choose a day for each to sleep with? Like Tuesday Tandy? <laughs> Wednesday. <laughs> and, you know, after that interview, yeah. I was told there were MPs coming for me. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That's awful. I actually did call him and he said, no, you can use it. There's so many stories, I'm sure we could just do a whole interview around just people of the South. But I'd also like to find out about yourself. You know, you grew up in exile. It must have been a very different, interesting life, knowing that you can't really come back to your home nation. And when you eventually did come to South Africa, do you remember what it was like leaving the UK and what did mum and dad say when you were coming to South Africa? How did they prep you, you children? Were you, did you grow up in a home where you're consistently conscientized on what your family was fighting for, what was going on back home, or were you guarded and only really realized as you, you landed in South Africa? Oh God, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I, was, I was quite a radical person anyway, but I mean, no, I, I knew exactly what the struggle was about. Um, Dad would explain, Mum would explain. We lived it. ANC meetings in London. All my uncles and aunts were revolutionaries. I remember a friend of mine saying to me, how come you don't go for pop stars, which I did end up doing when I formed Artists Against Apartheid, but saying that, and I said, because all the people I admire are in politics, they're all revolutionaries, you know. But, you know, Joe Slover was just an uncle, um, Yusuf Dadu, all of these kind of people. They were uncles and aunts, you know. Uh, Ruth Monpati, I remember her saying to me, one thing you must remember, Dali, God is a black woman. <laughs> I'm telling him, him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was just growing up amongst them. They hosted Tabo and Becky and Zanle wedding the house and everything like this the wedding party so that was one side of it secondly you know i was quite left-wing um so i would go on demonstrations that had nothing to do with the struggle but which were about um either anti-racism or trade unionism or whatever it is and i got beaten up at one demonstration my father said to me what are you uh, fighting here the struggle is back at home yeah. and i remember saying to him dad the struggle's everywhere <laughs> <laughs> And how old were you at this stage? She was 17. You oh, know. Wow. And uh, I hung out with left-wing people. Mm. Uh, so when we came back, it was the beginning of a dream. We had always, that was the thing that drove us, was one day we'll go home. Yeah. Drove, I know my parents too. That was inevitable. We would. Uh, we didn't expect the cascading of events that took place when they did. It was really unfortunate that my father had that stroke when the movement and our people needed him most, you know, but he got what he wanted, which was for Uncle Nelson to become the first president of a free South Africa. That's what he always wanted. And that happened. He knew it was going to happen, even though he didn't see it. And coming back, I remember the airport and everything, even though they tried to stop our people, there were just so many who greeted the old man on his way back. And I knew that was the happiest day of his life. And then for me, you know, one day I'm with one of dad's bodyguards. Ivan Kozak put us up in Deep Slut in his house. And we didn't really need security. We had a lot, but the neighborhood became yeah. security. I was given an Uzi to put under my pillow. And I remember saying to this guy, look, I've never fired one of these. What, what if it just goes haywire? Right. And he said, I'm going to put it on pop so you'll just keep popping. <laughs> oh, wow. Weird thing. Anyway, so I remember walking down the street and this gentleman said to me, Dali, that guy looks like you. And I looked at this guy and it was like looking at your double, apart from the haircut. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, this is the first time in my life I've been in a street where the majority are my people. Mm. It was West Indians, African Americans, Black French, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, who were the majority. I could always pick out South Africans in mm. a crowd, but this was the first time it was really emotional. Just the realization, your home. Mm. I left when I was one. I returned when I was 31. 
Wow, that's insane. And do you have a, a precious fond memory of mom and a precious fond memory of dad? Yeah, um, of course. I mean, I felt really fortunate to have her as mother. Mm. And she was a lioness. She was the most compassionate of people. That's why they called her Matlala. She was my life. And not only did dad say to me, look, I'm going to be away. You've got to look after her. Just my pure love for her mm. and all of ours. You know, she could mix with lords and kings and queens. And she could mix as easily with the working factory worker, guy at a market, etc. They all called her mama. She was just one of those people who, although she always maintained that all my father and her wanted upon liberation was to retire, spend yeah. time together with over 30 years, they hardly did. They had him to tender his garden or small holding, etc. Very simple things. Um, she never got to do that. And so it was really tragic. That's all they'd looked forward to. But everybody knew she would have been an unbelievable first lady. Mm. There was an instance in Sweden where we were at the King of Sweden's place and Uncle Nelson had come and him and my dad were now after this function leaving. And dad says to him, after you, they had nicknames for each other. I think dad called him Boy Boy or something like this. <laughs> and he says, after you. And Uncle Nelson says, no, 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 after you. And this goes on. No, after you. <laughs> goes on until everybody, about 100 people, are just splitting themselves with laughter. <laughs> and I always say to people, you know, it was almost like you were looking at how they viewed politics. And that I know, because he personally told me, Uncle Nelson wanted O.R. to be the first president. O.R. wanted Uncle Nelson, you first. Mm. You know, the selflessness. So... All of that, you know, played a role, the family relationships. Uh, so my mother was the mother of exiles, and yeah. she was a formidable lady who was a feminist par excellence, and yet a revolutionary and a, a beautiful, beautiful woman. Yeah. Wow. Beautiful. Very, very beautiful and touching. I love how you keep referring to um, Dada as Uncle Nelson. Do you have a fond memory of something Uncle Nelson said to you that still sits on your chest today? Well, I remember he, he was still in prison, but I think it was Polesmore. And my mum in London, we were in London, and she had a call with him. And, you know, he was all, always legend. He was my uncle. And, you know, it, there was a lot of communication. Aunt Winnie and my mother and him and dad. And, you know, I just remember speaking to him the first time and being surprised how much he knew about me. And uh, artists against apartheid and all of those kind of things. And what a interested, genuine person. So even after that call, for me, he became more my uncle because the call wasn't about the struggle. It was just uncle and nephew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's precious. That's so precious. Well, I also, you know, remember him at the airport uh, yeah. when Dad returned back. I, yeah. I, I remember that because my mother shared her birthday with him. Her birthday was the 19th of July as well. And so they would always call each other in the morning or have breakfast in the morning, etc. And then he would get on with his famous day and we would take my mum to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so special. Mm. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the National Heritage Project. Um, that's yes. something very close to your heart. For someone who, who doesn't know what it's about, can you explain it to us and what if there's any future projects coming from it as well? Yeah, I was at the graveside of my father and mother, and uh, it was... 12, 15 years ago, I can't remember, 10 years maybe. And I said to him, we speak to them, you know, I said to him, you know, Dad, there's not a single statue of you in this country. Given what you did, I've decided to do a statue. And what do you think? And when I got home and in the evening, I just felt this message coming through. What would he say? And the thing I got was, don't do it just of me, Daddy. Do it of all of us. Wow. And then I grappled with that for a couple of months because I thought, well, how are you going to do like 5,000? <laughs> <Yeah, so. laughs> 
<laughs> so I decided to do 400. Mm-hmm. I'm only 100 in, but they're all life-size statues, bronze statues, realism. So they look like the people. We've studied everything, their shoes, their facial features, their height, their weight, etc. And we've depicted them. They're all walking in one way or another. Some are on horseback. You know, the warrior kings, Makoma, Sandile, and people like this are on horseback. Yeah. And they're all relevant in their era. So you go from the 1600s yes. forward to 1994. That's why Mandela and Winnie are at the front in the middle. And then you've got OR and Adelaide and Walter and Albertina. And then you come back. And amongst them, there are also people like Nyerere and Martin Luther King and things. And the whole intent was to tell the story in statue form of our struggle so that you can go and take a picture with Lillian Ngoy and you can go and feast upon what um, Charlotte McCleke actually looked like. So it brings forward from the, the pages of history, if you like, it animates it. And it means that there, this procession, this pantheon is walking through the pages of history. And when you're in the middle of that, it's powerful. Was it not at the cradle of humankind yes. a couple of years ago? Yes, it was. I would say I was there with my son. So I'd say about, he's eight now. So about five years ago at this at the cradle. Yeah. Wow. I actually videotaped that experience and, right. and was quite flawed at the storytelling from the beginning. And they're all facing yeah. forward. And yeah. it is quite an emotional experience to stand in the center and have them all around you. It really is. That's it. And we just added Desmond Tutu. Wow. Um, and he's in his purple, pink, uh, clerical robes, and he's a beauty. You know, we've trained a lot of black sculptors. We've pushed and promoted a lot of black sculptors. We've insisted on mentorship so that uh, we've worked with the University of Pretoria, their final year students. They've created sculptures for us. Uh, we've worked with people who would normally work on little figurines for sail at airports and things like this and given them serious things. And there are some people who are doing very, very well out of it. So it has been a bit of an academy and I love that fact about it. Yeah. Um, you know, we do consider ourselves experts in what we do because we want to honour these people. And the yeah. best way to honour them is make sure the statue looks like them, gives their humanity, and that if they're a family member, they feel, yeah, that's, that's my relative. Uh, Yeah, no, it's absolutely beautiful. So now that you are living in this country, it's been 30 plus years that you've been in South Africa. How do you feel about Mzansi? Really, really positive Mm. and optimistic and really worried. What worries you? I suppose it's that given the hill we have had to climb since the defeat of apartheid, I don't know if there's been the unified step-by-step progression that we should have seen, but it's a really steep hill. And we should never forget that we've made amazing progress, but we should have done better. And I hope that in the future we will. You said very positive. What makes you positive about South Africa? Well, if you think about the amount of people who have running water, the amount of people who have electricity, roads, homes, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that you could say that ANC should be ashamed. We've transformed this country. We've transformed it to the betterment of a massive amount of our people. We started from a deficit, let's not forget, a looted, broke entity that only supplied electricity in the main to whites, You know, so all of those services, the social welfare system that we brought to bear, it's not perfect. It's got massive problems. And we will, of course, focus on the problems. But if you think of the mammoth leaps forward we've made, can't be ashamed of that. Mm. You You can't say that didn't happen. It's real. The extent of what we've done will always be compared to the extent of what we haven't done. Yeah. And so... In that vein, yes, we could have done a lot better. And whether it's sins of incumbency, the loss of Chris Honey, all kinds of things Mm. have contributed to us doing less than Mm. we should have done. But the point is, every single day of the week, and I'm 
promise you this, my sister, every single day of the week, there are millions of people who, under the banner of the ANC, get up every morning and fight for a better life for our people across the length and breadth. So we're not playing, but we've got a very, very steep hill to climb. And mm. we, we, we need to unite and we need to, we need to deliver for our people. Otherwise, we'll be judged fairly harshly, I think, in the future, a few generations from now. And I think the telling point, of course, is that the country goes to the polls next year. And there's been a lot of talk, obviously, on the political landscape of the South Africa that we are we are living with. You know, some people would beg to differ with your optimism <laughs> and your portrayal of it as a steep hill. Some would see it as just negligence in some instances, not being mindful of the poor and their needs and not providing for them. And some will say, you know, for a middle class South African, South Africa is great, but for a poor South African who doesn't have a job, who is battling all sorts of situations from, you know, not having a home to rife HIV in the community, teenage pregnancy, the list could go on. Someone else would say, no, we should not be happy with what we've, we're dealing with right now. Yes, and I would, I would totally adhere to that. I'm not trying to put a gloss on it. I have mm. friends in the United States, the wealthiest country on earth, who are going through exactly that, homelessness, joblessness, et cetera, et cetera. Some of them are black, some of them are white. But what we had, which is different to them, is apartheid. Mm. So, yes, we, when I say we should be doing better, I mean precisely what you just said, is uh, the alleviation of generational poverty is a task that cannot be underestimated. Education. I'm a janitor and my son becomes a doctor or a lawyer and you've halted generational p- poverty. If we did what Malaysia did with education 30 years from 94, we'd be in a different situation. Mm. I know, and this is all I'm saying, I know that there are rotten apples. Yeah. I know most of the barrel is good and they are fighting with everything they can bring. But I know there are the rotten apples and people must make their own judgments from where they stand. I may be fortunate in that I get to see the good side of the beautiful people who make up not just the ANC, but also the EFF, the DA, et cetera, et cetera. Within South African politics, you have a lot of people of integrity. Mm. And we're not enemies, we're adversaries, because one wants to go up the hill and one don't wants to go around it and the other through it. But that's what I'm talking about is when I say it's a steep climb, mm. is, is that it's difficult. Any way you look at it, it's difficult. And if I lived under the circumstances of somebody who's maybe in a squatter camp or whatever, I might feel a lot more radical about it. You're correct. But I'm not ignoring that perspective when I speak. I'm saying that I believe in real politic. And real politic means that there are some things which will take longer. And if you add on sins of incumbency and corruption and maladministration and all of those kind of stuff, then they take a very much longer. Mm. So yes, we should have done better. So are you proud of the South Africa you live in today? I'm really proud of its people. I, I think we're really adorable, you know. I think that we were never meant to be in that adversarial, racist, fascist existence that we had to go through to come to this point. I'm proud of the people, not proud of the economy. Yeah. I'm proud of the distribution of land or, or of economic wealth. I don't think much has changed. And I'm not proud of the systemic economic, racial status of this country. Well, let's move on to Moja Love. I know you're the chairperson there. And uh, (laughs) some of the TV shows that uh, are on the TV channel have found themselves in hot water for various reasons. I think the channel's always pushing the boundaries. What's it been like being part of the leadership? Well, I'm chairperson of CIA, which has a number of strands, but Moja Love is one of our main areas. There are a lot of talented young people who would never have found work in broadcasting who are part of CIA. And it's really crazy that 
were it not for channels like us and others that are juniors to the titans of the industry. Many of these people would not be employed and would not have the opportunity to express themselves in audiovisual specific targeted programming. So one obviously of their roles is interest the viewer who is LSM such to such, but also interest the viewer who is LSM such to such. So it's the creativity and all of that, which I love. And I love the fact that many of these young people 20 years from now are going to be well-known names in producing, directing, et cetera, et cetera. We're giving them that spot. And on a lighter note, as we come almost to a close of our conversation, I'd love to find out fun things about yourself. So do you have a favorite South African holiday destination that you love to go to? Yeah, Cape Town. I cycle along from Sea Point to Hout Bay, back up nice. um, and back down again. With my wife, we ride a tandem. Uh, we're in cow suits. <laughs> um, so we cycle for CHOP, which is Childhood Cancer Association. So their uniform is a cow uniform. <laughs> and, uh, I love cycling with her. And that's, uh, we, we've done 94.7s and Cape Argus many times. But now my knee is going, so we're cycling less. But that's my favourite holiday destination. I used to live there. I used to live in both places. Now I just live in Johannesburg. And do you have a favourite South African dish that um, whenever you have it, it's nostalgic? Maybe it reminds you of mom's cooking, if mom ever got to do well, some great I'm dishes. fortunate because my wife learned how to make my mother's stew. Lovely. And so I, I do think of her when I taste it. She's not as good as my mum. <laughs> <laughs> Say that softly now. <laughs> and then, you know, I don't get it often, but when we were in exile, I used to have this lady, my Auntie May, um, a coloured lady, and she was the wife of a famous poet. But uh, she used to make this incredible pickled fish. Wow. And so when we were in Cape Town, I tried to find places that do pickled fish. They can't do it like Auntie May, you know. Yeah. And so my mother uh, would have her deliver that. I think it was on Fridays every week. Those are dishes where when you eat them, you think of a whole era, you know. And the pickle fish reminds me of exile. And the stew reminds me, stew and poor man's dish. I don't know if that's what everybody calls it. It's what my mother called it. It's like a a mixture of whatever you've got in the fridge. Right. Mm, But when it's spiced right and all of this, yeah, they remind me of, my mum and dad and uh, the community. Aesop Pahad went the other day and I remember him coming over uh, for for dinners and things like this and always bringing dishes. But, you know, it was the South African community in exile uh, was about gatherings and so everybody would contribute something. Pickled fish. If your listeners haven't tried it, they must. It's the one. (laughs) And so, I mean, we go to O.R. Tambo and it's just, you know, O.R. Tambo, the airport, you know, the international airport. What's it like for you every time you step into O.R. Tambo? Considering I think it must be quite uh, iconic in the sense that when you came home, I'm assuming that's, of course, the airport that you mm. first landed in, which had a mm. totally different name. Yes. And, and now that airport is your family name. It's daddy's name. What's it like for you every time you go to O.R. Tambo? At first, it was quite eventful. I I mean, first of all, you know, they would put us in VIP and things like this, and I refused that um, because I enjoyed just walking through. It's what he did, not what we did. And then I would get people coming up to me in a huff and a puff. Mr. Tambo, they've lost my luggage. I've been talking to these people. (laughs) And I'd have to remind these people that I don't run the airport. (laughs) Um, and yet at the same time I do feel um, little bits of pride that I know that had that airport not been named after him even fewer people would know of him and uh, a friend of mine who's a teacher said to me that he asked the class um, hands up who knows who Oliver Tambo is and this boy shoots his hand up he's the runway man He's the airport man. <laughs> you know? The airport man. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's part of the education of people coming in or leaving 
the country, that there was a side of the struggle you may not have the detail on, but which was relevant, important, liberating, beautiful, sacrificing. And it's important that at least as South Africans, we know that history. Mm. So, yeah, I feel, I feel pride for him. He was one of the humblest of men, really. Mm. Just had no ego. Yeah. And, um, you know, when you're like that, often, you know, I remember my mother and I and my sister going on with him. You've got to write a book. You've got to write a book. Ah, if I must write a book and take time off to write a book, then so much slovo, so much so-and-so, so much, et cetera, et cetera. All of this stuff. Now other people will write our story. And my mother said to him, I will not spend my time because people will steal your victories. She said, I will not spend my, the, my life after you've gone promoting what you did. He didn't care. All my dad wanted for so long was to, for the man he called the born mass leader to come out, take the baton and run with it. Mm. So I love the fact that he was honored anyway, because I know if, if he had lived and you had asked him, he would have said, no, give it to Lutu. <laughs> yes. You know, he would have refused. Mm. Well, one thing that's not lovely in South Africa is load shedding. What are your thoughts on load shedding? And do you even experience it or do you have solar panels? So you're like, <laughs> I'm off the grid. Every time we said it's going to come to an end, I would not buy a generator and it would come back. And I guess I feel like, well, this is what a lot of people go through, whether there's load shedding or not. And I'm quite privileged that, uh, you know, I live in a suburban setting. Mm. I've got inverters. And so, you know, in the early days, it really used to irritate me that I was just in total darkness. It's not good security-wise. It's not good in terms of your children's education and things like this and just functioning. But I'm not a shopkeeper. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt me as much as it does them. I'm not, I'm not uh, living in situations where I can't afford an inverter. So, you know, I, I often say to friends of mine, don't even complain because imagine another life. Mm. This is less than the norm for so many people. Mm. When you see people who haven't had water, running water for four years, it's, it's crazy to complain because yours is off for four hours. You know, so it's the same, I think. But at the same time, oh my God, we better get this together because... As many people say, if you can't keep the lights on, you can't do much. Wow, that's powerful. And lastly, if you could say something to South Africans. I think South Africans are in a space right now where a lot of us are frustrated. A lot of us love this country so much, mm -hmm. but things compound and the frustration mounts. People are just frustrated. The cost of living is is high and load shedding is there. And, you know, people just can't afford day to day. Unemployment is rising. Retrenchments are on the, you know, on the go. So I find that as South Africans, we just find ourselves, we love this country so much, but everything is just weighing heavy. And it's hard to see light when there's so many bags on your back. What do you say to the majority of South Africans? as inspiration because it sounds to me that you are extremely positive you seem to see a great future for this country what do you say to us to see the same vision you're seeing because for a lot of us it's not looking as great well there's always the short term the medium term view and the long term view in the short term view there's a lot of work to be done by all of us and that american saying it's the economy stupid rings true for any society if your economy is not functioning at an optimal level for the reformation of its original intent, which was to service the minority at the expense of the majority. If that equation has not changed, you have to change it. Because mm. if you don't, nothing else matters. Nothing. If my children are not going to be able to do better than me, if my grandchildren are not going to live in a more economically equitable country, Oh, my God. So on the one side, on the short term, I'd say we really better get into gear, whether we're talking political parties or government or society. This level of poverty will not be tolerated forever. So you, you fix it now. 
you fix it now. In the medium term and longer term, mm -hmm. you know what? Things can only get better. And I hope that there'll be shock treatment given to different sections of our society. Some political parties need it to reform and rebuild. Others need it to understand the philosophy, share this economy before we force you to. Others need it in terms of, yeah, that's like a real radical perspective, but it's not real politic. It's never going to happen, you know, so maybe we must get real. But I'm not, I'm not in that game. I deliberately chose not to be in politics. So, uh, <laughs> you know, OR's shoes, you never want to try and fill. And I'm not stupid. I know how vicious things are these days. And so the last thing I really want to do is make heavy political statements that I only get the privilege of making because I'm the son of, you know, it's really a complex issue. And I still maintain it's a steep hill to climb. <laughs> it is indeed. We will, we will slip along the way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We will. And we have. And yet all I'm saying is that I know in my movement, there are so many people of integrity who have dedicated their lives. They could be in business now. They could be doing all kinds of things. They've stuck the course because they believe and they take all kinds of kicks in the teeth just for being there. But there are many, many people of integrity within the ANC who are fighting every day for our people. So yeah, you speak about the future and I'm optimistic because I know our movement and I know there is no other force that could have freed us and there is no other force that can continue freeing us economically, but we must get our act together. Mm. Thank you, know? you so, so much. I appreciate you making time to chat to us and, and giving us your, your wonderful insight into the life that you've lived and the things you're passionate about and also allowing us into your beautiful home for this podcast. Thank you so much, Carol. This is the Carol Lafori Podcast, an East Coast radio podcast. Follow or subscribe via ecr.co.za under podcasts or your phone's podcast app.